Good evening. Uh, first song this evening is going to be number 585, Soldiers of Christ Arise, 585. Sing the first and last verses of the song. Let's sing. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through His beloved Son. That having all things done and all your conflicts past, you may overcome through Christ alone. You may overcome through Christ alone and stand entire at last. I'd like to go ahead and mark the invitation song following the lesson this evening. That's going to be number 714. 714, Trust and Obey. After you found that, we're going to turn over to 627, The Glory Lamb Way, 627. We'll sing the first and last verse of the song as well. Let's sing. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for. I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above, oh, I'm in the glory land way, I'm in the glory land way, I'm in the glory land way, heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. A little better. What? talk to you just for a few minutes tonight on an electronic device. Actually, I'm not going to talk on it. I'm going to talk about it. And I'm sure everybody knows what this is. No, it's not an iPad, not a cell phone. This is a GPS unit. And I'm sure just about everybody in here has one in their car. And I'm trying to figure out what a GPS stands for, and I think it's going places safely. Either that or Grandpa's stew, one or the other. So I think it uh, does have another meaning. But this electronic device has made it easy, life easier for a lot of people. If you're on the road a lot, you don't know where you're going, you punch the address in here and generally it will get you there. But on the other hand, it's only as good as the programmer. It's not perfect because it's man-made. Now this little device here and the one that you probably have in your car, I mean, you can buy a standalone unit kind of like this, or you can order your new car and, and sit there in the dash and all nice. Not like mine, one of the hang on units where you got wires <laughs> between the cigarette ladder and this, and you got a front facing camera. And, uh, and it's kind of like a, one of those places where you have to go through to get out the other side, got to go through all the kind of traps and things, especially when the dogs want out. Then you got to plug everything back in. 
But this GPS system that you use, I use, uses approximately 80 satellites. And those satellites are located some 11,000 miles above the Earth in orbit. And I was looking at a diagram of all those satellites up there, and they're, it's a wonder they're not smashing into each other. There's got to be a lot of stuff up there that people have to look out for. And the purpose is to provide a accurate location service to anybody that has a GPS receiver. Any place on Earth. And this system is owned and operated by the U.S. government. Like I say, the units are small, optional equipment and vehicles, and when you order your new car, and they're extremely accurate. Now, give you an idea how accurate they are. Before they came in usage, uh, in my career with the railroad, I served as a construction surveyor. And it took at least three men, it was better if you had four, to go out and do a survey. And first of all, you have to establish a point of uh, beginning, which you had to start off from a known point, go through that, establish your beginning point. And it pretty much would take all day just for a small job. Then back to the office, plot the points, go back out in the field, make the adjustment, put the iron pipes in the ground to mark it. But now, uh, the land next door to me, uh, Trent and Bree's house, the surveyor went out there to do the work. And he's out there by himself with a handful of stuff. And I said, where's your crew? He says, you're looking at it. And he takes this unit, goes out here, well, here's one, walks around the yard and uh, comes back. He said, well, I'm through. I said, you're through. Man, you haven't even cut any bushes. I mean, you had not trumpled down anything. Well, I've got it all right here. And uh, it amazed me. I said, well, how accurate is it? He says, I can set this, any point out here, within three sixteenths of an inch. And some of the work we did, we were lucky to get it in the same county. And it was amazing. And the purpose for location, navigation, Automobiles, if you're going someplace you've never been before, you punch the address in, it'll take you right to the front door. Vacation trips, delivery trucks, ships, airplanes, artillery, missiles. And how about this new thing where you got a drone that'll come make your delivery right out in your front yard? That's amazing. Hunters, hikers, fishermen. Really neat for fishermen because where they're biting, you can punch the coordinates and come back a week later and go to that same exact spot. Um, and if they're equipped, you can get traffic and weather information. But best of all, when you're traveling, we all want to get to our destinations safely without making a wrong turn and wind up 100 miles out of the way. That's why I say going places safely. And generally, when you're going somewhere, there are two routes that you can take. Now, we're on I-95 for just a couple of minutes when we come to church, also known as Death Highway. I don't know if y'all drive I-95, but I think a lot of people have that 95 confused with the speed limit. Drive a speed limit on 95 and you're a snail. You got tailgaters, lane changers, those that cut you off and turn. Don't that infuriate you? <laughs> and drug traffickers. And I want to say something about, about drugs real quick, just a second. Just show you how the terrible this stuff that's coming in our borders is. You probably heard it, but if you have, please caution your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. Tell them this stuff is, you know, I just can't tell, imagine how bad this stuff is. The Central Disease Center reported there were 107,000 
deaths last year in the United States from drug overdoses. And by the way, there's a new synthetic opioid, uh, and I hope I can spell, pronounce this right, protonazine. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's three times as strong as fentanyl. And fentanyl, just about the amount that, a, a amount that an ant can carry is enough for you to OD on. Matter of fact, if you got a penny in your pocket, if you don't, I got a couple that you can borrow. Look at a penny and look at Lincoln's ear. The amount of fentanyl to fit in his ear is enough to kill you. This stuff is awful. And to think this this other stuff is this new is three times as strong as that. So it's it's kind of like playing Russian roulette, putting six bullets in the gun and hoping for a misfire. And it takes three times the amount of Narcan to revive a person from this if it's administered in time. And that's the type of people that you're going to find out there on that road. And when Penny and I are traveling, we like to take the back roads, the state roads, the U.S. highways, uh, it's like going over to Alabama, we take 84 generally. We'll go up to St. George, up to Fargo, and it's a, like 84 is a straight shot to Waco, Texas. And it's a easy, stressless drive. Uh, let, uh, better drivers, better scenery. Drive, drive 95 always says palmettos and pine trees. And um, and it's like I say less stressful, especially if you're pulling the camping trailer. And these units, these C, uh, GPS, will help you determine your best route. And if you got sometimes if you got two routes, one will get you there, and the other will get you lost. So when it says turn left, bear right, you better do it. Now in like manner we have a special GPS. You know, we're on a trip through life and our destination is an eternity in heaven, right? Now, I want to go there. And we have two routes that we can take. One will get to our destination in heaven, and the other, will get us, the other one will get us lost in a devil's hell. And those two routes are described in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And what kind of people will you find on those two routes? Say route one, the wide road, which it describes those people, 1 Corinthians 6, 9th and 10th verse, says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, revilers, extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous, just to put it in a nutshell, that's those who are not doing the will of God. Matthew 6, 21 says, Not everyone in it says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of God. Now the narrow road, the righteous. In Revelation 2nd chapter 10th verse says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. And who are the faithful? Those who have been baptized into Christ for the remissions of sins. Acts 2, 38 and have lived faithful unto death. Now the GPS I was talking about is this GPS here, which stands for God's plan of salvation. 
want to extend the invitation at this time. If there's anything that we can do to help you this evening, won't you come as we sing the song that's been prepared? All right, we are good. I got the green light. We're going to get started um, tonight with our lesson. Uh, this week, uh, we are looking at um, parenting, our growing in Jesus as a parent. No, I'm not an expert, just like I'm not an expert in marriage, I'm not an expert in parenting. Um, you know, any time that you do a study, and I think anybody that has led a Bible class, okay, whether you are a lady and you headed up a ladies' day, or you, you're teaching your class, um, you do a sermon up here, or a Bible class, and you're doing something, you're putting the material together, sometimes you look at it like, man, this is hitting me dead square. I mean, I, there's so much that I need to continue to do a better job at when it comes to being a parent. Um, and so tonight, we're going to look at this idea, and, and our topic, our theme verse for tonight is found over in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, where it tells us that we need to train up our children, right? We need to train them in the way that they should go. Um, even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, growing up, there was two TV shows that I watched a lot of, and maybe you've watched them before. We got Leave it to Beaver there. You got Ward and June um, um, Cleaver. Um, um, they, they're the parenting skills, man. They, they were on point, weren't they? Um, you got Mike and Carol Brady. I mean, let me tell you something. These two families have something in common. No matter how big the problem was, they could solve it within 30 minutes. I mean, how do they do that? I mean, every problem that they face, they solve in like 30 minutes. I mean, it's amazing. Um, but anyway, so tonight we're going to look at this idea of parenting. You know, I think one of the, 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 the key things that we need to make sure we understand is we need to make sure that, that God is the center of our home. That God is that center. Over in um, Psalm 127, it says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In Psalm 128.1, it says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You know, how can we ever expect to have a good family life if God is left out of it. It is so important that God is the center of our family. When we look at this idea of growth and parenting, you know, we can need to understand that, that when we become parents, I remember when Ava was born, and they released us from the hospital, and we, you know, you're spoiled there, right, when you first have the kid because the nurses are taking care of the baby and stuff. Um, and, and so when they said, okay, you're released now, you can go home, me and Natalie looked at each other like, what do we do now? Like, like I mean, we're at home here with this baby, and we've had people taking care of it since it's been alive, and it's like, man, we're on our own now. What do we do? There's no owner's manual that, 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 that comes with the baby, is there? You know, you can look at bookstores, and I don't know about you, but Natalie, before she had kid, before we started having kids, she would have those read all these books of what to expect when expecting, and and all that stuff to try to prepare her for delivery. Yeah, nah, that stuff he can't prepare you for that. And you can read all these books on 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 how to be a good parent. Yeah, you might be able to take some of that stuff, but man. I mean, it doesn't prepare you for the real thing. You know, the Bible, though, God's Word can help prepare us. God's Word can show us how to be good um, parents. As we, as we look here, he says, He who knit our children together in the mother's womb, which is found in Psalm one thirty-nine thirteen, and in Luke 2, 52, provides ample instruction so they might eventually increase in favor with God and man. We look at this idea of direction. Psalm 127.4 talks about this arrow in the hands of a warrior. So, the, so are the children of one's youth. You know, think about this idea of an arrow. Arrow, when you're using it, it needs direction, right? 
Young people need direction, don't they? Young people, if you saw some of the things that I saw in the school system, they're not very smart for the most part. Some of the things, some of the decisions that they, even the brightest ones, some of the decisions that they make, not the best. They need guidance, don't they? They need guidance. What does a parent provide um, um, right now to a young person? What can they provide? Is that a bad question? Uh, and what do we have that they don't have? Well, we have. But what do we have that they don't have? A little bit of wisdom. A few years on them, don't we? We've lived that life, right? We've seen a lot of mistakes that these, we probably done a lot of those mistakes. And we know, yeah, you don't want to do that. That's not good, is it? Don't want to do that. I've done that before. Don't want to do that at all. Um, you know, David, he lived that principle. Um, when you think about when he was, wasn't able to, to finish the temple, he knew that it was Solomon that was going to have to do it. And David made sure that he gave Solomon that di direction that Solomon needed to make sure that temple was built the way that God wanted it to be built. As we continue to look here, I'm going kind of fast here, y'all, because I have a lot of slides and I want to get through some stuff. But we can look in the Bible and we can look at children that weren't faithful, but they had faithful parents. We can, and, um, but parent, these parents that were faithful, they made some big mistakes also. You think of Cain. Um, you think of Cain, he killed his brother, right? Um, I mean, we don't have a lot on Adam and Eve. I mean, we don't have a lot of scripture on Adam and Eve, do we? I mean, a lot of things, when you think of Adam and Eve, what do you think of? What do you think of? What comes to your mind first when you think of Adam and Eve? Yeah, the fruit, right? You're like, okay. I mean, they committed the first sin. I mean, they brought sin into the world. Way to go, right? Um, but that's what we think of. Um, but we don't know anything else from them. You know, we can look at um, Esau, and we can see the situation there. There was some, some situation of favoritism, wasn't there, in that household, wasn't there? I mean, Isaac um, and Rebecca, Isaac and Rebecca, they kind of had their favorites, didn't they? Isaac's favorite was who? Esau, right? Rebecca loved herself some Jacob, didn't she? And you had that scheme against Esau, right? Well, I mean, do you think maybe that could be a, a reason why Esau kind of went off to the side? And look what my parents did here. My, I mean, my dad didn't have my back here. <laughs> I mean, and I just lost my birthright. I mean, you look at Samuel, his children, his sons didn't walk in, in the way. Um, did they? You look at David, his own son, what did he want to do? Take the throne from him, didn't he? Remember Absalom? But you look at David and how for a while there, the type of father he was, the things he let the kids get away with, and, and the things that David did. I mean, I mean, yeah, we see all the sorrow and the repentance that David had um, after, as he, as he, I mean, as he got past a lot of that stuff, but you look at kind of David as a father. You think about it. I mean, he had a daughter who was raped by a, by a half-brother, and he just kind of turned the other cheek and didn't do nothing about it. And that was Absalom's sister. So no wonder why Absalom wanted to take the throne from David. Right? I mean, David didn't do his job as a father there in handling that situation. You look at uh, many kings. There's many kings in Israel. You look at many of the kings that were faithful to God, a lot of times their sons came along and they went back and they become unfaithful, didn't they? Hezekiah's son, uh, Manasseh, was one of the ones that were unfaithful. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this, I put this in here because, you know what, as parents, we can do the best that we can do. When the kids leave our roof, when the kids leave our roof, if we did everything that we could do, okay, when the kids leave our roof, they hit that certain age where they have to take some responsibility for their own self. Right? And they have to take some responsibility. And we see it here from, from some faithful people in the Bible. 
that they had children that had issues that were not faithful. So when we think about this idea of training, what are some things that we can do? I think number one, I think it's important for us to be consistent. Consistency is important, right? And I'm not talking about not only like the rules that you have in your house. I'm not just looking at that, but I'm talking about consistency. How you are in public, are you that way in private? How are you in private, are you that way in public? Okay? I mean, if you're, if you're at work, are you around all the, if you're around co-workers that are using all kinds of foul language, are you jumping in there using that foul language too and then coming back home and not using it or, or maybe even using it at home, but then when you get here on Sundays, you, I don't ever use any of that stuff. Okay, I mean, that's just an example. But it's important that we make sure that we're consistent. Our kids need to see that. Our kids need to see consistency from us at home. What they see at home, they need, we, need to have, we need to have out in public also. They need to see that um, from us. Um, I've already talked about profanity. Um, what, what do they see when they see you with your wife, with your spouse? What do they see? Because if you are raising sons and you treat your spouse horrible, and that boy, that son, watches his daddy treat his mom bad, what do you think that son's going to do when he gets married? He's probably not going to treat his wife that well, is he? Because he sat there and watched it. Right? Or if mom marries a man that is not faithful at all, or, or um, let me, I mean, actually, if dad married, if the mom is not, I already talked about it, about the dad, the, if the mom is not doing her stuff, doing what she needs to be doing, right? If, if, if she's not there um, as, a, as a partner with the dad and doing her job, if you have daughters and you see how mom is doing things and handling things in the household, when they get old enough, they're going to treat their husband that way. So it's important that we model the way we want our, what, it's important that we model what God expects when it comes to marriage. Because our kids are watching. I mean, they're like sponges, aren't they? They're like sponges. They watch what we do. They watch what we do. We need to make sure that um, we practice what we preach. There was a song, a country song, um, by Rodney Atkins that says, I'm watching you. I don't know if you've ever heard that song before. But it's a song in like the very first um, version, like chorus of the song, not chorus, but stand, stands of the song. It has the boy and he's eating in dad's truck and he spills something on him and he let, let out a four-letter word. Okay? And the dad was like, Basically, boy, where did you hear that from? And he said, Dad, I've been watching you. Because Dad was using that kind of language. And so it's important that we practice what we preach. You know, we need to be involved, don't we, in regular Bible study. And this is something that, you know, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? When you work all day long and you and you, you come home and kids have homework and you're doing homework and then you have to get supper done and by the end of the night you get tired and stuff and worn out and but it, it is so critical so critical that we make time don't we that we make time to do some type of Bible study and make sure our kids are in God's word it's important um, for us to do that and it's important for our kids to see us doing what Studying, right? It's important for us, our, our kids to see us praying, not just before um, dinner, but it's important for them to see that we have an active prayer life as we try to train them to have an active prayer life. I, I constantly talk to our high school class upstairs about you know, you've got to, you're at the age where you've got to, to start doing some of this stuff on your own. 
you got to take ownership. You got you got to, you can't just wait for mom and dad to say, "Come on, let's do a prayer." You at some point have got to start developing some type of routine where you yourself will take it upon yourself to open God's word without being told, to to say a prayer um, to God without having to be reminded. Yeah, they're still kids, and yeah, we still need to guide them, right? But but at some point they have to start. Um, but if they see us doing it, if they see that it's important to us, it's going to be important to them. It's then in hospitality, um, faith, faithful and worshiping with other Christians, so important that, that we're making sure our kids are here. Right? So important. I have seen so many in my years... I've seen so many kids that have left the church. And they have left the church because it wasn't a priority in the home. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't a priority in the home. People, I mean, parents didn't come regularly. I mean, they, I mean, they weren't here for, for Sunday. They didn't place an emphasis on, on Sunday school at all. If they showed up, they showed up during worship service, maybe pop in right at announcements. Back when we used to have announcements back in the day at the beginning, they pop in then, and that was it. And then as soon as amen, we're out the door. And they did that for so many years, and then when they finally, the parents try to get their life right where, they're, where they need to be, I mean, the kids have already seen it, right? And they're already going on. And that's not the case all the time, but that's a big case. It's important that we place emphasis on worshiping with other Christians, that we're involved in saving the lost, that, that our kids see that, um, that we're involved with, with people. I'm not going to mention this, this name, but I saw a family. There was a family here um, that had young kids, and um, they went out one night, and they started driving around and bringing different people like, flowers and stuff and I thought it was pretty neat that they took their kids and they visited random people within the church and they just made their night with a bouquet of flowers and and what an example those parents did for those kids to show those kids um, um, what they need to do rejoice in the fact that we're saved we need to be happy. If we're in a saved relationship. If we're saved, if we know we're going to heaven, shouldn't we be happy? Yeah, this world can beat us down, but ultimately we should be happy because you know what? No matter what happens in this life, man, it is not going to compare to what heaven is like. Heaven is going to be amazing. You think about this. Do you really think that that, and this is just me speaking, okay? But do you really think that, I mean, you look at the beauty here on this earth. You can go to some beautiful places, can't you? And you can look at these beautiful places and say, man, this is a beautiful place. But do you think that this earth, the beauty of this earth, is going to compare to the beauty of heaven? I mean, the beauty of heaven, man, that should get us all excited, we should all be excited. Because, I mean, this, I mean, you think about the description of heaven, the descriptions that we read about, but even more important than that, you think about some of the things that's mentioned. No more tears. We're not going to cry anymore. I don't know about you, but I started this new job at Publix, okay? And so I'm doing a lot of physical labor. I'm unloading a lot of trucks. Okay, I'm lifting a lot of heavy pallets. So in the morning time, I'm hurting everywhere. Okay, my elbows definitely have been killing me. I'm not going to feel that when I leave this earth. How awesome is that to know that? And it's going to be eternity, forever. We should be excited. as, And our kids should see the excitement that we... If we're faithful in the death, are going to be an eternal eternity with our Heavenly Father and those that are faithful. 
don't sacrifice their eternal future for the present. So many parents are so worried about what their kids are going to do. Okay, I want my kid to be a doctor. I want my kid to be a lawyer. I want my kid to be a professional athlete. And they focus so much on all this stuff about the future, and they miss the most important stuff in the present. I put up here a softball travel ball because I'm telling you right now, travel ball has gotten out of control. It's out of control. Travel baseball, travel softball, these kids are playing every weekend on Saturday, on Sunday. I remember back in the day, you used to never play on Sunday. It's all day on Sunday. I had a guy that I used to coach with at Mount Dora. Well, I shouldn't have said that, but what, they're not going to watch. Um, they're not watching. Y'all, yeah. But anyway, I, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that, but you know what? I'm going to go with it anyways. They were involved in travel softball. And so they, I used to say something to him all the time. You play on Sunday. What, what, what is that showing your kids? Oh, well, we, we do worship service at the field. We have a worship service at the field. That's not the same. You're still placing the emphasis on what? You think you're play, placing the emphasis on God? Now, I'll tell you this. I'll brag on somebody real quick. I will brag on our preacher. Will play tribal baseball. But Will, when they were out of town on Sundays, if they had a game during worship time, you want to tell you where they were at? They missed that game. They were at worship at another congregation. There was an emphasis. Baseball is not going to come before God. I know of Will missing several baseball games on Wednesday night because Ryan's like, no. And Ryan's even had talk with the coaches. So, but there are many people that place that emphasis on so many of the wrong things. Um, and they miss out on the important things. You know, um, when, you, when you make these choices, the career place of employment, where you live, um, just remember those impact that's going to have on the kids. Um, make it a point to get your kids involved with other Christian families that have kids. You know, if, they, if there are um, activities going on, make it a priority to make sure. You know, take them to gospel meetings. If there's local gospel meetings going on, take them. Take them there. There's going to be other kids there too, and they have an opportunity to meet more people. But every time they have a chance to listen to the word of God, you never know what, what it could do for that kid. You never know. So it's important that we make sure that we take them there. You look at the Fredericks and the Comptons. Where are they at this week? They, they took vacation to go to Fried Hardeman to go to the lectureships. So their kids are there at the lectureships this past week. Make it a problem. Not all of us can do that. There are things local that we can do to make sure our kids are involved. Make sure that we, we do that. Um, let me limit the amount of time that you're away from them. Um, make sure, and this is a problem that, you know, it seems like a lot of younger parents have today. And I ain't talking about younger parents here. What I'm talking about when I see in the school system. Younger parents that want to be the cool parents, right? Younger parents that want to, want to make sure that they're friends with their kids, right? Instead of being a parent to their kids. Making sure that, um, that, that we are having those, um, those important conversations with our kids. Um, you know, you look at Deuteronomy 6, 7, um, where it tells us to make sure that we teach our children. Teach them diligently, right? So they'll continue to walk in the ways. Um, don't turn your head if your kid starts going down the wrong path. Don't turn your head and say, oh, they'll make that change. They'll change eventually. They're just going through a little stage. 
Don't turn your head. Get on them. Like I said, once they leave our household, there's not much we can do. I mean, when they become adults, there's not much we can do. All we can do is what we have when they're in our household. That's all we can do. Um, be dead serious about the right things. And here's what I mean by that. You know, if you're stuck in traffic and, uh, or, 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 um, or something doesn't go the right way, you know what? We don't need to be like it's the end of the world, right? Sometimes I struggle with that. I get impatient. Come on, this person needs to hurry up or whatever. I just went against I'm that person that Bob talking about in 95. <laughs> um, but it's important that, um, that our convictions take precedence, precedence over um, convenience. God's laws take precedence over opinions. Our marriage is more important than our career. Worship is more important than our hobbies um, and our homework. I know of kids that the parents let them stay home because they have so much homework, right? They let them stay home from and miss worship service. Yeah, Johnny has too much homework. Let him stay home. Oh, well, he has big tests coming up. Got to study. I mean, I mean, can't be doing that. You're sending the wrong message. I'd much rather fail, have my kid fail test and make some Fs than lose their soul. I can tell you that. Uh, making sure that uh, we're honoring God and obeying him, that it takes presence over everything else. Another thing that I think is important is, and we talked about this, is making sure that we're fellowshipping with the right people. That we're making sure that we're, that we're as parents, that the people that we're fellowshipping with are setting the right example for our kids. And I, I know growing up as a kid, I remember as a kid growing up, and I remember I was never around anybody that drank. I was never around anybody that, that smoked. I just wasn't around that as a kid. I, really, I, I didn't know what that was like because my parents never had me around it. I hope my mom don't get mad at me for this, but her dad, her dad was a drinker. Her dad was a smoker. His wife was a smoker and a drinker. And I didn't have much of a relationship with him. Why? Because they didn't want me around that. Now, they made it clear. I'm assuming they did because he didn't do it around us, but they made it clear if you want a relationship with your grandkids, you better not be doing that stuff around them. And any time I was around him, they didn't do that stuff. But it's important that we make sure as parents that we are around the right people, that when our kids are around those people, that they're around good influences, but that our kids are around the right people. I'm telling you right now, this is a, I see it so much. I look back, me and David Compton talk all the time about this. We look at people that we grew up with um, in the church, okay? And, but we look at, we look at the, and, and not just in this congregation, we're looking at other congregations too, the people that we knew. But a lot of times, people that place all their friends, all their strong connecting friend groups, the people that hung on, if they were not members of the church, they pulled those away. Pulled those individuals away. It's so important that your closest friend group all share the same faith that you share. That they all have the same beliefs, the morals, and everything else that you have. That's the best advice that I can give anybody. Because, I mean, I can look at all the people that I was so close to growing up, and we held each other accountable. Now, were we perfect? No. But if we started going down the wrong path, the other one called us out on it. If we, if we went down the wrong path, we got called out. And so, and, and, and you do sometimes go down the wrong path. This life, 
you, you learn, and, but it's important that you have a lot of those friends that will pull you back in when you're going down the wrong path here. So making sure that we, um, we have social interaction uh, with the right people. Let me go ahead and continue to move on. We need to make sure that we talk, because, oh, man, I'm running out of time. I got one minute to finish this. All right, we're going to speed talk here. Make sure that we talk about our faith um, and let our kids see it. Outside of worship services, we should be talking about it, okay? Um, there was a preacher um, who said once he um, had an observation he's seen in families where children are grown and unfaithful is that the unfaithful children have virtually succeeded in silencing um, the parents. And one thing we have to understand is that parents should never be silent. And they should never be silent in their home, right? And, and I think that if, if you're being afraid, instead of being afraid of offending or turning away our children, their friends or others, they need to be full, far more concerned about offending God um, than anything else. Um, if anybody should be tiptoeing and watching what they say, it's the unbelievers, not the Christians. All right? The people who are not faithful, um, they should be the ones that should be tiptoeing around we need to make sure that we make sure that um, our kids have a respect for God's word. Um, so we need to make sure that they have that. Um, they need to have a belief in the power of God. Okay, you know, wouldn't it be nice if if we could tell our children that um, that nothing will ever go wrong? We know that's not the case, is it? Things are going to happen to us in life. Things are going to happen. We're going to experience trials. We're going to experience tribulations, as it says over there in John 16. But how does our kids see us handling those things? Are you somebody that goes in drinking? Do you handle it in depression? How do they do it? Or they see you handling it by going to God's word. Do they see you handling it by going to prayer um, with God? How do they see you when you handle those situations? And I got... Okay, if y'all just bear with me, I got two more slides and we're done. All right, they need to be aware of the spiritual war warfare that they're in. Look here, the devil is going to try to pull them away. And they need to understand that. They need to understand that the devil is going to try everything in his power to to pull them away. That that nobody is um, invincible, right? Everybody, the devil's going for everybody. Okay. And so they need to understand that. Um, I mean, he seeks to destroy families, the church. I mean, he, he tries to do all that stuff. And then finally, the last thing I want us to look at is we need to give our children freedom. You know, even as young children, this is hard as a parent, right? To, to, to send your kid off and let them have some type of freedom. Look here, Ava reminds me every day, Dad. I'm 15. I need my learner's permit. I want it. And I keep ignoring her because I'm thinking of my car insurance that's going to happen when she gets that regular license, right? But ultimately, I'm more scared of, of just the worry of her going out on her own. But we've got to, to put the faith in our kids that we've been teaching them I mean, I mean, the stuff that we've been teaching them and training them for to prepare them to go out and handle anything that they might fa face um, in this life. So we need to make sure uh, that we do that. That's all I have. I'm sorry I didn't let nobody talk tonight. I apologize. I'll blame that on the technical issues that we had tonight. But let's close in the word of prayer. Most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings that we have in this life. We know everything we have, we have because of you. Our dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you please be with each of us tonight, dear Heavenly Father. Um, be with us, dear Heavenly Father. Bless us. Let us be that example to everybody we come in contact with. Let us especially be an example to all the young people, all the young people around us, dear Heavenly Father. Let us be that example. Let us be that light. Let them see how... Um, a Christian should behave, dear Heavenly Father. Just continue to be with each of us. Continue to bless each of us, dear Heavenly Father. We're just so thankful for Jesus and what he did for us. It's in his name we pray.
Amen.